Welcome back to MCB 170, Society and the Brain. This is lecture 25, which corresponds to part one of module 13. The title of module 13 is Elective Recollection. In module 13, we'll be discussing memory on both the individual and group levels. In part two, we'll focus more on collective memory. In part one, we'll focus on individual memory. So what does memory allow us as individuals to do? Well, it helps us recall experiences, learn facts, gain general knowledge, recognize objects and people, acquire skills, and form attractions and aversions. As a preview, I'd like to point out that the first four aspects of memory are aspects of declarative memory. Declarative memory is the kind of memory that we can declare we can tell someone about it. So I could tell you about my trip to Paris, for example. Another very important aspect of declarative memory is the personal identity narrative, which records the major events of our lives. It's essentially our life story. Is the personal identity narrative an accurate history of our life? No, it absolutely is not. Research shows that an individual's memory for life events can be grossly inaccurate especially concerning their importance in them. And it can change with time and with retelling and reassessment. So the personal identity narrative can be inaccurate and we keep changing it around all the time. Why? It's because the, per the, the, the personal identity narrative is not meant to be an accurate history of our life. It's meant to be a story that situates us as the individual within the larger society and gives us an important role. And through the fulfillment of that role, we can derive self-esteem and a feeling of self-worth. A personal identity narrative is very important for our psychological well-being. And that purpose is served better by a story that may be inaccurate than by an accurate history of our lives. We'll talk about that more in part two. Memory is often divided into long-term and short-term, and that's a property mainly of declarative memory. And we have this notion that memory goes from short-term to long-term. That's the process of consolidation, which we'll, dis we'll discuss um, in detail later in this lecture. But there are multiple memory systems, which we will also discuss later in this lecture. Uh, what we commonly think of as memory is declarative memory. And that's mediated mainly by the cortex and the hippocampus. We've spoken about the cortex many times before in the course. We've also spoken about the hippocampus, mainly in the context of stress. The hippocampus helps us detect stressful events. But the, the hippocampus is also central in, the, in, the, in declarative memory and in the process of consolidation of declarative memory. And we'll talk about that in detail in this lecture. This is the diagram we've shown many times before of the limbic system, this more or less circular uh, set of many cortical and subcortical brain regions that together mediate emotional processing. Part of that is the hippocampus. The hippocampus sits right next to the amygdala, important for emotional processing, particularly fear, and this place called the parahippocampal gyrus the parahippocampal gyrus is part of other cortical regions in the temporal lobe that work with the hippocampus in mediating declarative memory and consolidation of declarative memory. Our understanding of memory increased by leaps and bounds through the patient who was called HM until he died in 2008, after which the world learned his name was Henry Mollison. He was an amnesic patient who sustained a large bilateral resection of his medial temporal lobes in order to relieve symptoms of severe epilepsy. So HM was a man who had epilepsy, serious epilepsy. He had terrible, terrible violent seizures. And his doctors knew that his epileptic seizures originated in his temporal lobes and most epileptic seizures do, do originate in temp the temporal lobes. And so to treat that, 
they actually surgically removed big chunks of his temporal lobe on both sides of his brain. It was a drastic brain surgery, and that was the first and last time it was ever performed in North America. Specifically, the surgery removed about one half of his hippocampus, much of the parahippocampal region, and the amygdala on both sides. Post-surgically, HM didn't have epilepsy anymore. He also lost his memory. He lost past memories, but in a time-dependent manner, and he exhibited profound impairment in forming new long-term memory. So he lost previous long-term declarative memory, and he could not form new long-term declarative memory. However, he retained short-term memory, and he could learn new motor skills. So this was a revolutionary moment in neuroscience. This man who had his temporal lobes removed, his hippocampus, amygdala, parahippocampal region, lost one particular kind of memory, but not other kinds of memory. And the memory affected long, the impairment affected long-term memory. And his impairment was both retrograde, he lost memories from before his surgical procedure, and he could not, he, and also anterograde, he could not learn new things after his procedure. He basically gave neuroscience its modern view of memory. These are MRI scans of two individuals. On the right is a normal individual, on the left is HM. Down here, you can see the hippocampus. Above it, the amygdala. Below it, the parahippocampal region, including entorhinal cortex, EC, and the parahippocampal, and the perirhinal, perirhinal cortex, PR. On the left, you can see these regions are missing from HM. A neurosurgeon went in and used a suction device and literally sucked out the hippocampus, amygdala, Entorhinal cortex and perirhinal cortex, most of the parahippocampal uh, cortex. This is a picture of Henry Mollison. He had his surgery when he was around 20 years old. This is a picture of him probably in his 40s. He had this surgery in the mid 50s. In the mid 60s, they asked him if he could reproduce the floor plan of the house he grew up in when he was a kid. He did it very accurately. 10 years after that, approximately 20 years after his surgery, he could still draw pretty accurately the floor plan of the house he grew up in when he was a kid. This is a form of declarative memory. So he retained a declarative memory from early in his life, but he could not form new declarative memory. And he lost declarative memories that were recent to the time of his surgery. I'll explain that a little bit later, later on. He also had very good memory for motor skills. This is an example of a star tracing task. The individual has to use a stylus to trace out the form of a star, a five-pointed star, but his only visual feedback is through a mirror. So the, the movements have to be reversed. And here's HM's performance in three consecutive days. And you can see that he improved very rapidly. HM had very, very good eye-hand coordinate. He was also a very intelligent and amiable, great guy. And he learned this task very rapidly and he improved from day to day. So he was retaining his memory for skills. That was not affected by his le the lesion of his hippocampus, amygdala, and parahippocampal region. Interestingly, HM could not remember from one day to another performing this test. The experimenters would ask him, oh, hello, uh, HM, on day two or day three, do you remember doing the star tracing task? And he'd say, no, I've never done that task in my life. Then he'd sit down and behave and, and perform the task almost flawlessly. So this shows this very dramatic um, separation between different kinds of memory, some that is mediated by the hippocampus and the parahippocampal region, and some that is not. So this led researchers to identify the three main memory systems. Declarative memory, procedural memory, and emotional memory. 
Declarative memory is memory for facts and events. You can declare them. It involves connections with the cortical association areas, high-level cortex, and the hippocampus by the cortical areas immediately surrounding the hippocampus, known generally as the parahippocampal region. Procedural memory. Memory for habits and skills and refinement of sensory motor behavior. It involves the striatum. We can think of the striatum as the second highest level of the brain, whereas the highest level is the cortex, including hippocampus. The next level down would be the striatum. Procedural memory involves the striatum, and it also involves the cerebellum. We haven't mentioned the cerebellum too often. The cerebellum is mostly involved with coordinated movement, a little bit with cognition, maybe a tiny bit with social cognition, but mostly involved with coordinated movement. Finally, emotional memory is memory for preferences and aversions. It involves the amygdala, which receives sensory information from cortex, thalamus, and subcortical regions, and projects to the hypothalamic pituitary axis and the autonomic nervous system. We'll talk about each of these three uh, memory systems in turn. Here's a diagram that gives you an overview of the three memory systems. All of them involve the cortex, the various lobes of the cortex. On the right, we have declarative memory, memory for which is episodic and semantic. An episode is an event. Semantics is words, facts, because most we remember most facts in terms of words. It mediates con conscious recollection and flexible expression. So we can learn a bunch of facts, but what we learn isn't just a list of, of isolated facts. What we can remember, what's in our long-term memory, really is an organized collection of facts. It, 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 it includes not only the fact, but how the different facts relate to each other. So we can reason with our declarative memory. On the left is procedural memory or motor memory. It's memory for habits, skills, and sensory motor adaptations. Sensory motor adaptations basically involves things like eye-hand coordination, like learning to play tennis or tune in. The main structures involved are the cerebellum and the neostriatum. We can just call it the striatum. Emotional memory is memory for con conditioned preferences and aversions, like an aversion would be, I don't know why I don't trust the person who just came up to us in the train station, I just don't. And emotional memory can also is also involved in memory modulation. So events that are emotionally arousing are more likely to be remembered in declarative memory. Um, and um, skills that we need to get ourselves out of tight situations are more likely to be remembered in procedural memory. The main structure for Emotional memory is the amygdala. As we mentioned before, the main structures for declarative memory are the hippocampus and the parahippocampal region. So let's focus on the declarative memory system. The declarative memory system has three neuroanatomical components, cortex, basically including all four lobes, the parahippocampal region, the collection of cortical areas surrounding the hippocampus, including the perirhinal and entorhinal cortices, and the hippocampus itself, which has substructure, it has subdivisions, including the dentate gyrus, the CA3 and CA1 regions, and the subiculum. Here are diagrams showing the interaction between the hippocampus, the parahippocampal regions, and parts of the association cortex, high-level cortex, in primates, monkey in this particular case, and rodent, rat in this particular case. You can see that the hippocampus communicates with the cortex through the parahippocampal region, and this communication is two-way. So not only the hippocampus, but also the cortex surrounding the hippocampus, the parahippocampal region, is important for memory and for memory formation. And the severity of amnesia, declarative memory loss, is greater if the cortical areas surrounding the hippocampus as well as the hippocampus itself, are damaged. So amnesia is a selective disorder of declarative memory. 
What is lost in amnesia is declared in memory, memory for facts and events. And it has both retrograde and anterograde aspects. Retrograde is for memories that happen before an amnesic event. Anterograde is, is deficits that occur after the amnesic event. What would be an amnesic event? Usually it's some form of brain injury. It could be a surgery as in HM's case, or it can be an accident. It can be a, a high impact accident, which causes the brain to move around inside the skull. Like a serious car accident, if you hit the windshield with your forehead, your whole brain is gonna slide forward and the temporal lobes can hit hard against the bottom of the skull and be damaged. This can actually cause amnesia. Retrograde amne in retrograde amnesia, memory is lost for events preceding the amnesic event, but limited to a, a specific period of months or years before the event. So the memory for language and childhood events is intact. As I'll show you in a second, retrograde amnesia is not uniform memory loss for all events that occurred before the amnesic event. Events that occur remote in time early on are retained Events that occur closer to the time of the brain injury are lost. That's the pattern of, of retrograde amnesia, the gradient of retrograde amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is amnesia for new declarative memory. Thus, amnesics cannot form episodic fact uh, events or semantic fact memories for, for um, events that occur after the lesion. In amnesia, short-term memory, procedural, and emotional memory are generally intact, and higher order perceptual, motor, and cognitive functions are normal. So amnesia really is a disorder of hippocampus and surrounding parahippocampal region that affects declarative memory in a time-dependent dependent fashion. So here's what the gradient of retrograde amnesia looks like. On the right is a famous example of patient PZ from Russia who had Korsakov syndrome. Korsakov syndrome results generally from alcoholism, chronic alcoholism, and it involves a generation of the thalamus and the mammillary bodies, which are roughly in this part of the brain. But we've been talking about how memory involves the hippocampus and the amygdala and the parahippocampal formation down here. But notice this, this curve, this black curve here, this is called the fornix. And the fornix is this huge fiber bundle that takes, uh, that, can, that, that allows the hippocampus and amygdala and associated regions to communicate with the rest of the brain, to relay in the thalamus and project to the cortex. In Korsakoff syndrome, it's the fornix and the mammillary bodies in the front of the thalamus, this region here, which degenerates. The hippocampus and amygdala and parahippocampal formation might still be okay, but it can't communicate with the rest of the brain because this region of the brain is degenerated. In this particular case, the particular case of PZ, he had written his autobiography. So researchers knew his life story and they could later, later ask him his life story when he did not have the benefit of access to his autobiography. He had an answer from memory and they showed this very clear memory gradient. So after his his, his syndrome was full blown, he couldn't remember anything new. And he lost memory for recent events, but he retained memory for events that were more remote in time, like from his earlier childhood and early adolescence. So PZ demonstrates the retrograde amnesia gradient very accurately. This is patient HM, Henry Mollison, um, who participated in the so-called famous faces task in which experimenters showed people pictures of famous people from different decades, from the 1920s until the 1960s. The test was probably done in the 70s, in the, in the 90s sometime. This test was probably done in, in the, um, it was done in the 80s, done in the 80s. And they were asking HM and other, other people to recognize famous people from their images politicians, actors, athletes, famous people. And the gray bars show HM's memory recollection, the percentage of correct recalls. The white bars show normal people and the black bars show patients who had other kinds of brain damage, not 
not damage to their temporal lobes, to their hippocampus specifically. And this little score here marks the time of HM surgery in the mid 50s. So there's a couple of things to notice, first of all, that in all cases, people with brain damage had worse memory than normal people because the, the black bar is always shorter than the white bar. Another thing to notice is that for distant memory, there's some amount of forgetting, right? Even though amnesia tends to spare remote memories, memory for things that happened a long time ago, most of us, even amnesic, amnesic people, tend to forget stuff as, as time goes along. We forget things that happened a long, long time ago, right? So this is memory retention. Memory retention is in amnesics is relatively better for remote items than for recent items. But in general, in healthy brains, and in the amnesics even, uh, memory is relatively worse for items that occurred a long time ago. But you can see that in HM, the gray bars, his memory was actually better than most other people's for events that occurred a long time ago. However, his memory was very poor for famous faces, recent to the time of his surgery, and after his surgery, he couldn't remember any famous faces anymore. So the famous faces task, as, um, as tested on HM, also shows the retrograde memory gradient. Again, in retrograde amnesia, memory is relatively spared for remote events, highly impaired for more recent events. As I mentioned before, memory consolidation, it can be thought of as the transfer from short-term to long-term memory. But long-term memory isn't just a bunch of facts. Consolidation involves an integration of new and reorganization of old memories. So consolidation really involves not only the facts themselves, but how all those facts are inter interrelated into something like a story or some cognitive framework that gives facts meaning in relation to each other. And it turns out that the hippocampus is an important structure for the development of these relationships, for developing relationships, remembering them, and for allowing the rest of the brain to manipulate the facts uh, and to essentially serve the system of relationships between memorized facts. Neurophysiologically, consolidation involves interactions between the hippocampus, parahippocampal region, and cortex. Damage to the hippocampal and parahippocampal regions impairs the consolidation process. Depending upon the memories, the time required for consolidation ranges from days to years. So for example, you might consolidate the facts of this lecture in a couple of days and remember them for your test on Friday. However, certain events that might occur in your life that might seem kind of mysterious. You're not really sure if they mean anything or not. It might take years before you understand or can consolidate and will commit to long-term memory the, that idea and its significance and its relationship to other facts and events in your life. Neurophysiologically, during the consolidation process, the hippocampal region is thought to retrieve memory items from cortex, whether long-term or short-term, Hippocampus is retrieving short-term memories and long-term memories from cortex and sending them back to cortex in order to establish relationships and stable representations of those relationships in the cortex. And the hippocampus is central to the consolidation process because the hippocampus is the place that stores memory items in the intermediate term and establishes relationships between them and allows the brain to move within that system of, 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 of relationships. And here's a beautiful experiment by Howard Eichenbaum's lab that shows how this works in rats. Rats were taught paired associations between food odor stimuli. Specifically, they were taught A goes to B, B goes to C, X goes to Y, Y goes to Z and I'll elaborate that in a minute. They were then tested for transitivity, essentially skipping over B and going directly from A to C, or symmetry, going backwards, going, for example, from C to B, 
Transitivity and symmetry test the rat's ability to flexibly express learned associations between remembered items. So the hippocampus is allowing us to surf our system of interrelationships the way you can surf the web, the internet. In fact, uh, the hippocampus has been likened to Google searching the, the, the uh, World Wide Web. Both normal rats and rats with hippocampal lesions learn the paired associates, and normal rats show strong transitivity and symmetry, so they can, they, they can perform brilliantly on the tests of transitivity and symmetry, but rats with hippocampal lesions were severely impaired in transitivity and symmetry tasks. Here's a diagram from that research paper. Here you see a set of three associations, and these are odor stimuli. So we can think of the first as strawberry, the second is blueberry, the third is kiwi. And so the rat is, is, is taught to associate A to B, strawberry to blueberry, and then taught to associate blueberry to kiwi. And the rat also might be taught to associate, say, chocolate and coffee, and coffee and peanut. And rats can learn these associations even if they've had hippocampal damage. Then they're tested later on transitivity. So for example, the rat may be, be exposed to strawberry, right? And then have to choose between kiwi and peanut. And the rat needs to choose kiwi. Or tested for symmetry, the rat may be, may be acute with kiwi and have to choose between blueberry or um, coffee, and the rat needs to choose blueberry. Rats are incredibly good at this task. They can learn sequences of odors up to six long and still succeed in uh, symmetry and uh, transitivity tasks on those long sequences. They're better than humans are, but rats with hippocampal damage can't even do it for short sequences. This shows us that what the hippocampus does is it remembers fact and the relationships between fact, and it allows us to surf or move through those systems of relationships when we try to form, through the process of consolidation, some system of relationships that provides meaning to all the different facts and allows us to store them in an organized way in which all those facts have some meaning within some larger context. Okay, let's switch to the procedural memory system. There are two basic types of procedural memory. First, acquisition and refinement of habits and skills. These include re repeated motor patterns and long action sequences in response to complex stimuli like remembering to play a piano concerto, for example. And the key structure is the striatum, which Eichenbaum calls the neostriatum. They're synonymous. We can just call it the striatum. The striatum, as we mentioned before, is part of the basal ganglia. And two, second, adjustment of sensory motor transformations and reflexes, including sensory guided actions and eye-hand coordination, as in playing patch, playing tennis, knitting. The key structure is the cerebellum. Procedural memory actually accounts for more than just simple skills. Um, the striatum of the basal ganglia is involved in learning the probabilities of events. We've spoken about this many times before. Our automatic processes are not um, fixed at birth, but our automatic processes are set up to learn, to learn kind of automatically from our experience with the world. Our automatic processes learn statistical relationships among um, events and things. And we cannot declare them, right? Learning these probabilities is non-declarative. Um, we don't trust that person who just came up to us in the train station. We can't really say why, but our experience in the past has led us for some reasons to be mistrustful of that particular individual, right? This involves the striatum, the basal ganglia. Uh, and let's see how this works. Um, as we spoke about in the last module, the parts of the striatum are important for movement control 
and they degenerate in Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's patients have degeneration of their striatum. Amnesic patients have degeneration or damage of their hippocampus. These two sets of patients perform very, very differently on tasks that involve learning probabilities. Amnesic patients with hippocampal damage and Parkinson patients with striatal damage were compared on a game in which they had to guess whether combinations of playing cards predicted rain or shine. Okay, so the probabilities were, were assigned beforehand. Normal subjects learn the conditional probabilities to about 70% correct. These are pretty hard guessing games. They only learn them to about 70% 70, 70 correct. Parkinson patients do very poorly on this task but amnesics perform at normal levels. So amnesic patients with hippocampal damage, temporal lobe damage, they can't form new declarative memories, but they learn those probabilities as well as normal people. However, normals and Parkinson's patients can recall the events surrounding the task, the experiment or the room, et cetera, but amnesics cannot. This suggests that the striatum, but not the hippocampus, is necessary for this kind of probability estimation. And the hippocampus, but not the striatum, is necessary for recall of task events. And here's an example to show you how difficult this task is. Um, the subjects were shown combinations of four different cards with complex geometric symbols on them. And they had to guess from that whether that combination of cards predicted rain or shine. So it was a very hard task. Um, normal people did it to 70% accuracy, and so, did, and so did amnesic patients with hippocampal damage. Parkinson patients um, could not learn it. However, the normals and the Parkinson patients remembered the, the circumstances surrounding the test the experiment or the place they played it, the deck of cards, et cetera, that the amnesic patients could not. So this shows us, I think in a very subtle way, the difference between declarative and non-declarative forms of memory. A declarative memory is a memory you can declare, you can tell somebody about it. A non-declarative memory is something you know, kind of maybe motor memory or in your gut, but you can't tell somebody about it. They're mediated by very different parts of the brain. Finally, emotional memory. Like procedural memory, emotional memory is a non-declarative form of memory. It mediates learning of preferences and aversions of which we are usually unaware. So the striatum is mediating the learning of probabilities associated with different outcomes. Um, emotional memory is more involved with preferences, whether we like or dislike something. And again, it's non-declarative. We can't tell somebody why we like or don't like a particular person or a particular environment. We just kind of know that we do. The key structure is the amygdala, which receives input from cortex and sends its output to the hypothalamus and autonomic nervous system. The amygdala, as we've mentioned many times before, is necessary for processing emotion, particularly fear. The amygdala is also necessary for the acquisition of positive and negative biases toward previously neutral stimuli we talked about the amygdala in the context of implicit racial bias. The amygdala also plays a role in declarative memory modulation. Again, declarative memory is memory for facts and events. We're more likely to remember a particular fact or event if, it's a, if, it's, if it aroused great emotion. This emotional modulation is due to the amygdala. Emotional arousal increases attention and can also increase retention of salient events. Stimuli that evoke the autonomic fight or flight response, which is mediated by noradrenaline, the sympathetic nervous system and noradrenaline, also improve memory for stressful events. The noradrenergic stimulation of the amygdala is central to these, event, events, these effects. Blocking of noradrenaline receptors will disrupt memory modulation by emotion, but will not disrupt memory for neutral information. So that was very briefly a, a, a introduction to the declarative, procedural, and emotional memory systems of individuals. In part two, we'll be, we'll be discussing collective memory.
Um, one item of collective memory that's very important in our time now is memory for 9-11-2001. Probably some of the individuals taking this course were born after that time, but you still know about it because it's part of collective memory. Collective memory and the formation of collective memory are fascinating, particularly by analogy with the formation of individual memory. We'll talk about that in part two.